Hello, everyone, and welcome to our today's webinar hosted by Olia Medical. The topic of today's talk is a quantitative prostate MRI. Before I go further, I want to review functionality of Cisco WebEx. Your active participation is important throughout the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noises. Throughout the presentation, I will be managing the chat functionality, and you can enter your questions and comments in the question box. Now, I am very pleased to welcome you all and introduce you Dr. Daniel Margolis, Associate Professor of Radiology at Well Cornell Medical College and Assistant Attending Radiologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Well Cornell Campus. Daniel's primary focus is the use of MRI for the detection and characterization of prostate cancer with over 90 presentations and publications in this field. He has given invited talks to uh, about prostate imaging on three continents and looks to continue his successful collaboration with urologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists in order to fight against prostate cancer. So today we have a great honor to listen to Dr. Margolis' presentation on a quantitative prostate MRI, a concept whose time has come. Please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everyone who has made the time to uh, join the webinar. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to talk to you about a very exciting aspect of prostate imaging that I think will be very important for uh, helping men with prostate cancer uh, in the near future. Um, I should mention uh, I have the following disclosures. Uh, I've been a consultant for Blue Earth Diagnostics that make Oxymen and Cornell is the recipient of a research agreement with Siemens Health and Ears. The presentation will start by discussing PIRADS, current technique and assessment. I'll also talk about our current reporting recommendations before I start to discuss quantitative aspects of prostate MRI. And I will conclude by uh, making you excited about some of the uh, future aspects of prostate imaging. Um, so this is a slide I made uh, a couple years ago for a presentation on prostate MRI. One thing to keep in mind is uh, this is a log scale. So uh, you can see that the numbers go from one to a thousand. And what you see is a steady increase in the number of publications on prostate MRI, um, where spectroscopy sort of peaked about a decade ago. Um, Diffusion-weighted imaging um, has been steadily increasing, uh, but plateauing a little bit. Um, biopsy interest has also been steadily increasing. Um, and uh, maybe most importantly, there's been this fluctuation in the use of artificial intelligence and deep learning. Um, but interestingly, um, there was a sharp increase just after uh, 2018. So I think that advanced techniques for image analysis and acquisition are going to be an important part of how we manage men with prostate cancer. Um, so that brings us to uh, prostate imaging reporting and data systems version 2 and version 2.1, or PIRADS. PIRADS is designed for assessing primary significant cancer. What this means is it's designed to assess cancer that has not been treated and that is significant, meaning aggressive, rather than indolent prostate cancer. As many of you probably know, uh, there are varying grades of prostate cancer originally defined um, by Gleason. And uh, for the lowest grade of prostate cancer, now described as grade group one, we feel that these cancers have no potential for metastasis and very little potential for direct extension with the only cases of metastatic grade group one cancer seen in men who also have aggressive cancers that may be driving this behavior. 
PIRADS does not address some issues. So again, it's only MRI. It does not address PET or ultrasound. It does not address treatment planning, and it doesn't address the post-treatment imaging characteristics. Uh, and I'll describe some of the reasons why this is important as we go through the presentation. M uh, MP MRI is multi-parametric. That's the MP in MP MRI. And it includes T2-weighted imaging, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, diffusion-weighted imaging, and potentially spectroscopic imaging. But assessment in PIRADS is qualitative. We currently only have one aspect, which is quantitative in PIRADS. So um, how do we report prostate imaging currently? The, um, uh, current standards were defined a few years ago with uh, version 2 and updated uh, now a couple years ago uh, in version 2.1. Um, and uh, this is also freely available on the American College of Radiology website that hosts the ACR, ESUR, uh, Admitech, uh, PIRADS recommendations. Uh, and it includes uh, recommendations for technique, the description of normal appearance, assessment, and reporting, and staging. And I'm going to focus on assessment and reporting. Um, so there are different components that we need to assess and report. The T2-weighted images, which are most useful for the transition zone characterization and for staging, determining whether the cancer is organ-confined or not. Diffusion-weighted imaging with the apparent diffusion coefficient map, which is the most specific component and dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion imaging, which is the most sensitive. Um, the high B value is a crucial part of diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, but as you can imagine, the diffusion weighted images themselves are qualitative. So here you see uh, the same person uh, scanned on two different scanners with a lesion in the anterior prostate that's conspicuous on the ADC map with a B value of 800, um, this is not distinct, but only with a truly high B value image do we see that this is slightly hyper intense. And um, it, in fact, is the brightest thing on the image um, which is important in terms of the PIRADS characterization, which, again, is qualitative. Um, another important consideration is dynamic contrast enhancement timing uh, and the temporal resolution. So here you see a pre-contrast image of the prostate. Here you see the first uh, time point where we see enhancement of uh, that lesion in the anterior prostate. Eight seconds later, it's beginning to blend in with the uh, adjacent uh, transition zone, uh, even with a subtraction map of uh, the eight second later image. It's uh, hard to see that it's truly brighter than the rest of the prostate. But I will draw your attention to the K trans map. Now, K trans is a computed pharmacokinetic map, which is quantitative. Um, but PIRADS does not address this quantitative component. The only utility of the K-trans map in PIRADS is you can see it gives you basically the same information as an early enhancement image, um, with the advantage being that you don't have to hunt for uh, that first early enhancement image through your entire data set of multiple time points. So I like the K-trans map because it's one uh, image data set that allows me to find early enhancement. Um, but it may hold additional value in terms of characterization of potential tumor. Uh, MRI spectroscopy is technically very demanding. It adds the least area under the curve for characterization, and it has the poorest spatial resolution on the order of one centimeter, but it's very specific. And we can quantify the ratio of choline plus creatine to citrate. 
Uh, and I'll describe that in just a moment. Um, and so again, we uh, assess the peripheral zone qualitatively in diffusion weighted imaging. And what you see is that we're looking to see uh, if an abnormality is the darkest thing on the ADC and the brightest thing on the DWI, as you see here. And then the other component, the one quantitative component in PIRADS is size. Size differentiates between categories four and five for both diffusion-weighted imaging and T2-weighted imaging. With the other aspect that may make the difference between category four and five, invasiveness. But whether or not something qualifies as category three or four is qualitative. Is it the darkest thing on the ADC and the brightest thing on the DWI? Similarly, for T2-weighted images, size is the only quantitative aspect. The other aspects that qualify a lesion are shape and especially the margins. Um, and um, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, these are the descriptions for the transition zone. Um, and the peripheral zone is uh, similar um, with uh, this being replaced by the uh, linear wedge shape uh, description. So here are some examples of T2-weighted imaging. Um, and you can see how we apply these standardized descriptors to rank the level of suspicion. But you can also get a sense that the appearance of the lesion itself, and especially the edge of the lesion, differs between the uh, various appearances. And I'll describe in just a bit why this is important in terms of quantification. And then here's how we give the overall PIRADS category. You might think, looking at this, well, this is also quantitative because it's a numerical score. But in fact, this is considered a ranked category. So these are numerical categories. They confer differing and increasing levels of suspicion, but they're not based on quantitative factors except for the size. And that brings us to how can we incorporate quantitative aspects into prostate imaging? Um, I first want to uh, refer to a really excellent review of quantitative prostate imaging um, that covers a lot of this, uh, some aspects in greater detail, and also provides a very comprehensive bibliography. Um, with the lead author, uh, Nicholas Skida, uh from University of Ottawa, and uh, my colleague, Barris Turkbay, as the senior author from the NIH. Um, and uh, this was published uh, less than a year ago. Uh, there's also um, my uh, neighbor uh, from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as one of the authors, uh, and it describes both current and future quantitative techniques. So I'm going to first discuss spectroscopic imaging um, as an example of one of the first aspects to try to quantify uh, prostate MRI, uh, but also as a reason why it's so fraught with difficulty. So some of the chemicals can be quantified, specifically citrate, choline, and creatine, although choline and creatine overlap, and we have a composite peak of the two. Uh, choline is a marker of cellular peripheral proliferation, which is increased in cancer. Uh, high cellular turnover means more choline. Citrate is a constituent of uh, healthy prostate glandular cells, um, but as a component of the tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle, it is consumed, and so it's depleted in cancer cells. And by looking at the ratio of choline to citrate, we can derive a quantitative map um, when choline is less than half the value of citrate. Um, this is uh, consistent with benignity 
And when this ratio exceeds one, when choline is higher than citrate, um, then this suggests malignancy and especially aggressiveness. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, spectroscopic imaging is very technically demanding and uh, very time demanding. And so we generally dispense with it. Um, the other advantage of quantifying this choline to citrate ratio is that it discriminates various uh, grades of cancer. So uh, this publication is from uh, nearly a decade ago at this point uh, by my colleagues when I was still at UCLA. And what you see is gray group one is significantly lower than gray group two uh, and gray group three. Um, so let's think about uh, current prostate MRI and the differences between the qualitative and quantitative aspect. Um, and so here you see a T2-weighted image. Uh, we can also acquire quantitative T2 maps as well as texture features. This is a diffusion-weighted image, and diffusion gives us both the quantitative ADC map, which we can currently use, as well as advanced techniques like intervoxel incoherent motion deconvolution and high angular resolution diffusion imaging with multi-shell acquisition. And finally, dynamic contrast gives us the early enhancement map, but we can also generate pharmacokinetic map. So why is DWI so useful? Here you see uh, a pathology slide image of a low-grade cancer, and you can see that there's a lot of cytoplasm and large cells. And here's high-grade cancer, and you can see that these are densely packed small cells. Um, and so here's an example of how diffusion imaging uh, works to generate signal between the two. So as we apply uh, the diffusion, if we uh, only wait a short amount of time for a low B value, we'll get signal from both a small cell and a large cell. It's still within uh, the area that will generate signal. If we wait a little longer though, with a high B value, there's nowhere for the water uh, protons to go. And so this still generates signal. But in this large cell, um, the protons have moved away from where we excited them and no longer are contributing signal. And so this is the basis for diffusion-weighted imaging. Uh, and the ADC is simply the slope of diffusion intensities given by this formula. It was one of the first uh, validated quantitative metrics. And you can see this is that same uh, publication where we also looked at the ADC map. There's a little less separation of the ADC values, but still a significant difference between um, the various grades of cancer. Unfortunately, some of these will overlap with benign conditions like prostatitis and hyperplasia. And this brings us to uh, uh, investigations of multi-B value diffusion. So this is uh, one of the publications in uh, the list of references I'll show you at the end. Um, and we can derive uh, the pure molecular diffusion component, fractional perfusion, and the perfusion-related diffusion components. We can also look at the deviation of diffusion signal from the expected signal. Uh, which gives us a measure of diffusion kurtosis. And these both show some improvement over raw ADC, but not in every investigation. So in this study, we found that the molecular diffusion component uh, provided added value over the ADC. But there are a number of publications, uh, including uh, from some other excellent institutions in uh, my fair town of New York City, um, that don't show improved performance over ADC. So um, we're still learning about how to acquire and analyze these components. And this brings us to advanced diffusion acquisition. So these use a combination of multiple B values, directions, and echoes to model cellularity. Uh, one example is restriction spectrum imaging. There are other examples uh, looking at luminal water imaging, which can also be generated from T2-weighted images. And then the landmark verdict study from 
University College London. Uh, these all show improved performance over ADC alone. RSI is FDA approved, and uh, there are techniques from the University of Chicago lo looking at luminal water imaging and, and the verdict study, which are currently research uh, projects, but we hope to see as commercially available soon. The uh, main drawback is these require a different acquisition algorithm, a different pulse sequence compared with standard diffusion imaging. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is a study we did at UCLA looking at ADC and RSI, and that RSI uh, better correlated with sites of tumor on whole mount histopathology in most cases. So let's take RSI as an example. This is something I didn't include in the handout, uh, just because I wanted to give it as an example. You can think of populations of water protons in different shapes. And the way we apply different B values, but also uh, by using high angular resolution diffusion imaging, so multiple different directions, we can characterize whether there is some order and shape to the degree of restricted diffusion. So is something cylindrical, such as in a nerve fiber, or is it spherical in a cancer cell? Um, and that gives us the ability to look at spherically restricted versus hindered uh, and unhindered diffusion as part of restriction spectrum imaging. So this is the principle behind RSI and some of the other uh, high angular resolution diffusion imaging techniques that exploit the multi-shell uh, pulse sequence. Um, what about T2-weighted imaging? So T2 is an inherent property of uh, water protons. It can be measured. However, the time it takes to measure T2 is about two to four times as long as to generate a T2-weighted image. It has similar sensitivity, but may be improved positive predictive value compared with T2-weighted imaging. Um, however, these maps are functional and therefore lower spatial resolution. So some techniques will exploit um, a hybrid pulse sequence where you acquire a high spatial resolution T2 weighted image and a low spatial resolution quantitative T2 map. We know that the T2 of cancer is much lower than normal tissue. We also know that high grade cancer has a much lower T2 than low grade cancer. And so by um, exploiting these differences, um, we can look at uh, the luminal water fraction um, as it corresponds to the presence of cancer. Uh, and so here's an example where you can see on the T2-weighted image, there's a cancer here um, with a very uh, low T2 on the quantitative T2 map uh, from Journal of uh, MRI. But we can also look at the T2 weighted images and extract uh, quantitative information by thinking about the texture. So when I was showing you the images of how we qualitatively evaluate T2 weighted images, these were primarily based on how we as humans assess the images. We can also quantify the differences between uh, uniform, and heterogeneous and between circumscribed and uh, uncircumscribed areas by using second and high order uh, texture feature analysis. And uh, these have similar performance to the use of ADC. And so here's an example where this is a man that was undergoing radiation therapy. And you can see that the tumor here looks fairly similar Maybe it's a little darker here, but that may just be the image contrast. It's hard to really quantify a difference between these two. The entropy, second order map, doesn't show much of a difference between these two. But the energy second order map distinctly shows that there has likely been a response to radiation therapy in this case. So we can quantify the difference in response uh, in this case. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is quantitative perfusion. I've al already mentioned that we can fairly easily generate 
uh, quantitative perfusion maps, and these are very valuable even for qualitative assessment, but these maps are quantitative, and they also appear to discriminate between low and high grade cancers. Um, the main drawback to perfusion analysis is there's so many different potential ways to do it. We're still trying to figure out if we can improve on the maps that we already have. So uh, there are commercial uh, packages that will derive these maps, but what the best map will eventually be is still being investigated. And so I'm very excited about the use of DCE um, to discriminate not only between low and high grade cancer and cancer and benign features, but also to predict response from radiation and focal therapy. Uh, are there any drawbacks to quantification? The main limitation is generalizability. So some of these are protocol dependent, uh, the main exception being texture features, which is a sort of after the fact application. And you want to validate the values generated by your scanner with a phantom. And this is being um, developed by the RSNA and their Quantitative Imaging Biomarker Alliance. So we'll soon have a phantom where you can quantify your diffusion characteristics and maybe even someday diff, uh, uh, perfusion characteristics. Um, but also generating these maps can be time consuming. And that brings, the, brings up the question, are they really better than qualitative assessment? Are they going to be accepted by our referrers? Will they be recognized by insurance companies to compensate us for the extra work it takes to generate these uh, uh, additional maps and the additional data? And what's the use case for quantitative imaging over what we currently do? And these are still questions that we're trying to answer. The last thing I wanted to talk about was artificial intelligence, because of course, uh, this is going to both put us all out of work as radiologists, but also provide a lot more value for what we do and generate a lot more uh, jobs for radiologists. So it depends on which venture capitalist you're talking to. There are a number of commercial solutions being developed. I got two emails last week about new AI products uh, very close to market. Uh, for prostate MRI, but the approach is varied. So do they provide you a heat map, like in this case, or an attention box for something it thinks is suspicious? Does it look at only T2-weighted images versus multi-parametric MRI? Does it only look at a potential target or is it whole gland characterization? Um, and potentially the best view, uh, use of this would be qualitative uh, uh, assurance, so quality assurance. Um, and making certain that your images are adequate uh, quality, and maybe also um, prostate segmentation to identify where an abnormality. So what's the future of prostate imaging? There's a lot that's coming down the pipeline. PSMA PET MRI is being developed at my site and many others, and PSMA is adding a lot about, especially for metastatic disease. Uh, we've seen some advanced diffusion techniques that um, are largely still experimental, but should be applicable fairly quickly. Standardized dynamic contrast imaging is something that we hope to see very soon. Luminal water imaging will probably be commercially available soon. Uh, and then this integrated automated assessment or lesion detection and reporting is something that um, some of the vendors are already starting to incorporate in their software. And most exciting for me as a member of the PIRADS committee is what will be incorporated in PIRADS version three. And I can tell you that this is something that is a priority for the committee to include, to provide standardization in the amount of value that we provide. Um, and so here's kind of a um, workflow for uh, multi-parametric, multi-slice MRI we generate the qualitative parameters first. These give us a number of different quantitative parameters, which are then subjected to threshold and segmentation, uh, and then synthesis of the radiomic parameters based on ground truth pathology that gives us a correlation map of cancer aggressiveness. 
And this is ultimately the product that we hope this quantitative assessment and artificial intelligence will provide. So um, we've come to the end of the talk. I'd like to thank Olea for providing me this opportunity to speak to you about some very exciting aspects of prostate imaging. Uh, obviously, I need to acknowledge my colleagues in urology, Jim Hu, uh, and in pathology, Max Loda, um, who's not only uh, the chair of pathology, but an expert in prostate pathology. Uh, and especially um, my chair uh, for giving me the opportunity to do this kind of research. Uh, my colleagues uh, in radiology, including Timothy McClure in interventional radiology, for getting me the uh, uh, tissue to confirm uh, what I like to think. My colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Hedy Ritzak, the chair who invented prostate MR, and Alberto Vargas, who's head of abdominal imaging. My colleagues from UCLA were, uh, I did a lot of this original research, uh, Leonard Marks and Rob Ryder in urology and Steve Raymond in, in radiology. Uh, and then uh, Ida and Odo for developing a lot of the techniques uh, that we hope to see um, for quantitative assessment and uh, obviously uh, Olea as uh, our vendor collaborator. Um, so the take home point is that currently, PIRADS qualitatively characterizes primary significant prostate cancer. Quantitative analysis is available for multiple aspects, and integration of these quantitative assessments is on the horizon. Uh, so I thank you all very much for your attention and am looking forward to your questions. Let me open the chat. Thank you very much, Daniel. It was fascinating. So we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Yes. Uh, we... so... Yes, sorry. Oh, yeah. So I, I've opened the ch chat. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your question about MR LINAC. Um, so I should mention the images I showed of texture feature demonstrating response were from our MR LINAC. We have the view ray device. Um, and in fact, the meeting I had just before this one was about texture feature analysis for our MR LINAC. Um, and this is exciting because we acquire a low field T2 weighted image every day that the patients are being treated. And so, one of the things that we think quantitative analysis will do is predict who will respond and who may need adjuvant hormone therapy. But we also think that we can identify response even better by performing the texture feature analysis on the images being acquired during their treatment. And um, this could be very uh, game-changing for our colleagues because uh, this may allow them to tailor treatment during the uh, number of sessions, depending on whether they observe a response early on. So will they give a higher dose to the uh, dominant nodule or to the whole gland? And um, would they start hormone therapy sooner or later based on what they see? So texture feature analysis is going to be an important part of how we manage patients being treated with radiation therapy. Now, obviously, only a small number of patients are going to be treated with the MR LINAC system. Uh, there is many more conventional uh, radiation-guided systems out there. So one of the things that we're looking is, can we predict this with the pretreatment and potentially an early post-treatment MR? And it looks like um, this is also feasible. So uh, we're um, actively submitting grants to do this kind of analysis, uh, but I expect that quantitative imaging on the pretreatment and early post-treatment MR will provide the same kind of value, just not during the treatment session. Thank you, Daniel. It is really valuable to hear your point of view. Uh, we have some more questions from our audience. So the first one is about uh, what is a cut-off value to differentiate prostate cancer from benign tissue? Ah, so this is 
an, a really valuable question because we're talking about quantitative imaging. For qualitative imaging, the only cutoff we have is size, which is 1.5 centimeters. For quantitative imaging, you can not only define cut values, but strata of values that give a sense of aggressiveness. So this is one of the things that we uh, were developing at UCLA, looking at ADC. Um, however, as I mentioned, these are protocol dependent. For the general recommendation of the diffusion technique in the PIREDS document, with the lowest B value between zero and 100, ideally around 50 to 100, and the highest B value around 800 to 1,000, we know that values above 1,000 are generally likely to be benign or at least low grade. And those below 900 are more concerning for aggressive cancer with a gray area between 900 and 1,000. But I should mention that we had a protocol at UCLA where the lowest B value we were using was 400. And this was um, primarily to avoid the perfusion component of low B value uh, diffusion weighted imaging. So with IVIM, you can isolate the pure molecular diffusion component. Um, another simple way to get this component is to just avoid using values less than 200. Um, but what this means is that number was much lower, was about 20% lower than the conventional ADC if we use the full range of B values. So again, um, one of the reasons I reference the value of a phantom, uh, and one reason why quality assurance is so important is especially if you change your technique or start to use quantitative assessment, you're going to want to correlate that with ground truth, uh, either biopsy or whole mount pathology, or uh, PSA outcomes in patients being treated, treated with radiation therapy because it may depend on your scanner platform. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question regarding B values. So yes. if you would have the possibility to compute only one high B value by default, what yes. would it be? Excellent. So um, the Pirates document recommends a value around 1,400 to 1,600. Um, we had traditionally been using 1,400. Uh, I think uh, there was some software update, and now we're using 1,500. Th these values are similar in their ability to display cancer. Um, the disadvantage of higher values, like 2,000, which is used by a number of sites, is the algorithm used to calculate it becomes more sensitive to image noise. And what you'll find is some of the voxels drop out. So if you remember the KTRANS map image that I showed you earlier, this is also a computed map. And um, when there are voxels that deviate from the expected uh, uh, the expected direction of signal, then the system can't compute that value and you get a black voxel. Um, and the higher a B value you try to compute, the more likely you will get failure for some of the voxels. Um, however, it's uh, with uh, adequate signal, it's generally not an issue. And so what you might want to do early on is compute 1,400, 1,600, 2,000, uh, maybe even 4,000, just to see what happens. And if you're getting reliable uh, images at 2,000, go ahead and use that. Um, but if it's not working, stick with 1,400. Thank you. Great, thank you. Another question is regarding the difficulties. What is the main difficulty for radiologists to classify lesions today? Ah, so, the main difficulty, if you think about how PIRADS works separately from nearly everything else that we do, 
for most other characterization, we only have to look at uh, two image sets. So early enhancement, late enhancement, pre-contrast, post-contrast, um, you know, T2 and uh, um, T1. For uh, MPMRI, there's four different components, T2, ADC, high B value DWI, and DCE. And even with biparametric, you're still left with three. And so one of the difficulties is trying to resolve differences in when something looks suspicious on one of the image sets and not on the others. And uh, oftentimes what happens is there's misregistration or there's an artifact, um, but this makes the analysis very tricky. The other problem for radiologists is because we're using functional imaging, diffusion weighted imaging, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, um, there's more variation in uh, scanner platform protocols. And so while the T2 appearance will depend a little bit on the echo time, generally, as long as you get high enough spatial resolution, and your echo time is reasonable, it doesn't really matter what scanner you, you, you use. But between uh, 1.5 and 3 Tesla and between the major vendors out there, how the diffusion weighted image is generated in terms of the likelihood of geometric distortion, the resolution, the B values, the amount of signal you get, um, and the options you have to get that signal, um, what you find is that sometimes it, it takes too long to get uh, the signal you would want, and so you need to adjust the protocol, but that gives you different uh, image contrast. And so it's standardizing the platforms uh, that provides the biggest difficulty to radiologists. And that's one thing that um, the Pyrides Committee and the ACR in general is trying to negotiate with the vendors is a uniform uh, standard for a lot of these functional imaging uh, pulse sequences so that it doesn't matter as long as your scanner can perform its own quality control. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is regarding artificial intelligence. As mm -hmm. you mentioned, it's a great tool and uh, we agree with it. Uh, but what can't the AI replace today? What is the limit for AI? Ah, so um, this gives me an opportunity to uh, mention the, the value of um, dedicated uh, workstation software. So. Uh, Olea is um, one of the leaders. There are certainly other vendors out there. But the advantage of having this kind of software is it does a lot of the quantitative analysis for you and potentially provides um, an artificial intelligence algorithm. However, the limiting factor for artificial intelligence is we need to feed the algorithm a lot of validated data in order to generate the algorithm. And we need to be careful to avoid overfitting for data that has spurious components to it. So one of the earliest studies looking at the ability of AI to discriminate uh, multiple sclerosis from um, infarct-related uh, white matter disease found that the training set uh, performed remarkably well. And then the test set did terrible. And what they realized is that in the training set, the images with multiple sclerosis had a label at the bottom and the AI was being trained on that label and not the images themselves. And so making certain that the AI is trained on the appropriate data is one of the main limitations in developing these algorithms. And one of the advantages that we as humans have is uh, our subconscious ability to recognize discordance between what the image is showing you and what the test is showing you. In this case, the artificial intelligence um, cancer probability map. Um, and 
we can't easily train the AI to detect uh, artifacts or um, rare conditions that it may not be trained to identify, uh, such as stump lesions uh, or uh, variant uh, prostate cancers. There's also the problem with um, new scenarios. So in the post-treatment setting, the prostate looks very different than before treatment. If you don't have data uh, looking at the post-treatment prostate, then the algorithm won't know what to do with it. It doesn't have that input function. So um, the advantage that we as radiologists have is medical school. We are trained in understanding pathology and uh, how cancer is managed and uh, how we expect it to present and um, can determine whether the cancer probability map presented to us makes logical sense. Um, so the goal for me is the software basically writes the report for me and gives me a single button, validate. And when it's wrong, I click no and change it. And that's my job. That's the value of the radiologist. There's also the value that we provide in terms of consultation. So the AI is not going to help you decide, what do I do when my patient has an MRI incompatible pacemaker? What do I do when my patient has anaphylaxis to MRI contrast, yet I need to assess the patient after treatment? So there are these you know, high order questions that we as radiologists are specialized to answer that the artificial intelligence expert systems are still learning about. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. It will never replace uh, the radiologist. Uh, and another question regarding AI, relying on your experience, uh, do you think that AI will be mature enough in the next six months or two years or five years? So definitely, in some ways, it's already there. Um, there's one of the vendor packages for image fusion target biopsy, and in fact, more and more every day, that are using AI for prostate segmentation. And it works great, not perfectly, uh, but about half the time, I don't really have to adjust anything. About 25% of the time, it's just a minor adjustment. 15% of the time, there's a lot of work, but it's fixable. And then 10% of the time, I have to start from scratch because it fails. But that's great. It's, I, I'll take that 50%. So that's already there. Um, there are commercially available tools to help identify cancers. And I think uh, especially for radiologists that are just starting to use prostate MRI, just like when I was starting to read mammograms uh, in private practice uh, many years ago, um, having that AI to give me a second look was helpful in a rare but significant number of cases. Um, so there's already artificial intelligence that is being used to augment what we as radiologists do. Um, but to get to the point that it provides a prelim report that uh, may uh, you know, basically replace a lot of the work that we do, that's still at least two to five years away. Absolutely, thank you. Coming back to the patients, sir, another question is, to your mind, what could be the best active surveillance tool for prostate cancer? Good, so um, there are some studies looking at MRI replacing PSA for surveillance. The difficulty is the MRI has to be very inexpensive because the PSA test is fairly cheap at this point. Uh, the advantage is uh, it not only tells you if the patient may have prostate cancer, but where. So it adds a lot of value. I don't think that we're going to see MRI replacing the PSA test, at least in the United States, where MRI is still very expensive. But um, both Canada and the United Kingdom are looking at this possibility. Um, so we still recommend active surveillance. 
But one idea is you set your cutoff for triggering further analysis at a PSA level of 2.5 rather than 4, which is the normal cutoff for suspicious. And what you may do at that point is just repeat the PSA you know, right away and see if uh, it was an aberration. Then maybe repeat it at three to six months to see if you are seeing a uh, change in the PSA. So a PSA that goes from 2.4 to 2.5 is not that concerning, but a PSA that goes from 0.5 to 2.5 is. Um, and at that point, um, there are a number of options. Now, I live in New York City. I pass by an imaging center uh, in the three blocks it takes me to get to the closest uh, clinic where I work from my apartment. My relatives in Central Texas have to drive 50 miles to get to, uh, which is about 70 kilometers, to get to the closest imaging center to them. So you can see that there are disparities, even in my country, in terms of access to care. Um, for uh, my patients in New York City, once you hit a threshold of a suspicious uh, PSA value, it may make sense to do biparametric MRI, uh, a streamlined MR scan, axial T2, sagittal single shot, diffusion-weighted imaging, on and off the scanner, it within 15 minutes. And that gives you a pretty good sense of, is there something truly suspicious there? And if we see something that looks targetable, then you go straight to targeted biopsy and biopsy that. And maybe only the suspicious area. Um, if we don't see anything, then maybe you wait six months to a year, repeat the PSA. If it's still suspicious, then maybe at that point um, you would do a full multiparametric MRI with contrast to not only better rank the level of suspicion using DCE, but see if there's been a change. Um, and I think this may become the paradigm for how we manage patients here in the US uh, as well as in Europe. On the other hand, for my relatives in Central Texas, um, it may make the most, most sense for them to undergo uh, complex serum analysis. So OPCO 4K score, PHI, Stockholm, there are a number of blood tests that can be done that have the disadvantage that they won't tell you where the cancer is, but they have the advantage of telling you, do you need to drive for an hour or two to get to an MRI scanner to uh, actually find out where that cancer is? Thank you. Thank you, fascinating. And the last question uh, is about um, uh, different parameters. So do you think that AI lesion staging, pyrus scoring, especially uh, from score three, shall use a multiparametric approach merging IBIM, spectroscopy, G2 for diagnosis? So this is a great question because it gets to the utility of PIRAD. PIRADS is a way to communicate your level of suspicion uh, for the presence of clinically significant cancer. So category five, very high suspicion. We now know this confers about a 75% likelihood for clinically significant cancer. Category four, high suspicion, but really only 50-50 likelihood of clinically significant cancer. Category three, equivocal suspicion, um, which is about 25% likelihood. And then um, for categories one and two, the likelihood of clinically significant cancer varies anywhere from five to 15%, depending on the uh, group of patients. But you don't really wanna know what's the likelihood of cancer. You want to know if there is cancer. And with an OPCO 4K score, you get a percentage. It is 57% likely, it is 23% likely. And that is the goal of artificial intelligence. It's not to provide a PIRAD score. It's to provide the certainty for the presence or just as importantly, absence of clinically significant cancer. And so you could imagine that in addition to a cancer probability map to show you where, uh, 
cancer most likely is in the prostate, it gives you a single value of the likelihood that this man has clinically significant cancer, similar to an optical 4 K score. Um, and so rather than this uh, ranked category, PIRADS, it gives you a quantitative assessment, uh, possibly with uh, the confidence limit, so your 95% confidence limit. And you can imagine this could be extremely valuable um, where men where the uh, confidence is, is high and the likelihood is low, uh, they may not need a biopsy at all. Men where the confidence is high and the biopsy is negative may need a repeat biopsy and may need something like inbore prostate biopsy as opposed to image fusion. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we've covered all of our questions. So, Daniel, is there anything else uh, you want to cover be before I wrap up? I just like to uh, advocate that uh, prostate MRI is not the easiest aspect of imaging to get into, but it's something that I think is uh, its time has come. It's the fastest growing uh, diagnostic uh, indication for any MR scan in the United States. And um, we will soon have uh, a aspect of site accreditation through the ACR for prostate MRI. So um, I encourage everybody that is considering incorporating prostate MRI into their practice to uh, acquire adequate training if they're radiologists and to make certain their radiologist is trained if they're a referrer uh, and to uh, consider using some of these uh, advanced software techniques uh, to generate the pharmacokinetic maps or advanced diffusion uh, to improve the value we provide for our patients. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about an exciting prospect uh, that I think will transform all of our, uh, our ability to uh, treat men with prostate cancer. Thank you very much, Daniel. It was a great pleasure for us being with you today. And uh, the message is that the time has come. We agree with you and we hope that uh, it will improve diagnosis for life. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here and see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Take care.